Hello and welcome to another tutorial in Wildlife. This time we're going to be looking at the new UI layer system, which has been added in the December 2023 build. So let's just get started right away. Um, if you look down here, there's a new prop tab called UI. If you click on it, we can see there's a few uh, UI related props. Um, now the first thing you always want to do if you do anything UI related is add a UI layer. Let's put one in here. What this basically does is it allows all of the children it has to be rendered to the screen. You're also not limited to a single UI layer. You can add as many as you want and this depth value controls in which order they should be rendered. Higher values means it's more in front of other custom UIs that you have placed in the scene. You've probably noticed that these green bars have appeared. Um, they are the same as in normal props, this uh, yellow outline. It just shows you which uh, UI element is currently selected. Okay, let's actually add something to the screen. Uh, let's start with a simple UI text. Um, there's a new feature that you can just drag it directly onto an existing prop in the scene and it will set it as a child, which is very convenient for UI related uh, stuff. Um, you can see the text is now also selected as we had before and it only selects um, its actual size, not the entire screen every time. A bunch of new settings also appeared, mainly the layout and render transform sections. Every one of these UI props will have these two sections, um, so let's go over them. If you've ever used the UI editor built into Unreal Engine, this will seem very familiar to you. It's a direct translation, so if you are used to it, you probably don't even need this step of the tutorial. But uh, for everyone who doesn't know, the first thing we have is horizontal alignment. That's just um, how this object is aligned horizontally in its parent container. The parent container is the UI layer, so the entire screen. So you can see if I move this around, you can see it moves around on that axis or the full width. Same with the vertical alignment. And of course we can mix and match them both together or put it in the center of the screen, however we like. The padding options tell the UI system how much space it should leave um, on the respective sides. So if we put this to say eight, there'll be eight pixels of space before the actual element starts. The same with the top. And of course we can't see it because it's not aligned. Oh, let's just quickly do that. But uh, it works in all directions. It's even easier to see if I put it on full. You can see there's eight pixel on this side, 45 here, 45 there, and 101 on down here. So let's now have a look at the render transform section. Initially, the position offset might seem like it does exactly the same as the padding, except it's something that gets calculated after the UI has been layouted. I'll just demonstrate by using something that I haven't explained yet. I'll get to that, don't worry. If I add a horizontal box and add multiple texts, you can see they're next to each other because they're in the horizontal box. If I change the padding, everything gets pushed over. Whereas if I change the position offset, it only changes that text after the fact that it already has been layouted. The next few settings should be pretty self-explanatory. Um, rotation, well, it changes the rotation of this UI widget. Um, scale multiplier just scales it. This is also um, after it has been layouted. So if there was a text here and I scale it bigger, the text, the, the text next to it wouldn't have been pushed. It would remain where it was. And we also have a shear setting that um, will sort of skew the text in both um, directions. And yeah, then it's just settings related to the text like font size, um, if it should be bold or not, the color, and of course, what the text should be. Okay, let's have a look at the next UI prop, which is the UI image. Um, by default, it's just a small white square. You can um, override its width and height if you just need a color background for something, you can use this. Um, but you can also select a file on your computer to have it displayed here. For example, I've just loaded in a picture of the Mona Lisa um, and I checked preserve aspect ratio, which um, will have a different size as the image itself, but it'll just try to have this um, constrained to its actual aspect ratio so it's not stretched in any direction. Okay, now let's have a look at these layouting containers. Um, by default, the UI layer acts almost identically to a UI overlay, meaning if I add a text and another text, they will all just overlap that one. So if I do this, you can see it's not very nice. If you want them to automatically align um, beneath each other, we can use the vertical box and every child of the vertical box will automatically try to, well, 
layout itself below the other one and it'll respect all of the sizes of whatever you did with them and all of the padding. But you might also have noticed that a new size setting has appeared in the layout section. This um, tells the vertical box how it should be layouted inside of it. Auto just means it'll just uh, put them as close to each other as possible. But if you select fill, it will fill the entire space with that. These are still on, all on auto, so they will just uh, cram themselves into the space that's um, left. Um, so, for example, if I select them all and put them onto fill, you can see they're evenly spaced out now. And this fill value just gives it some weight. So if I select this um, one in the middle and give it more weight, then it'll have more space. And of course, it's uh, almost identical uh, in the horizontal box, except it's um, horizontal. Mixing and matching them is also absolutely not a problem. So I could have a horizontal box of multiple vertical boxes. You can see they're layouted. Um, add a text to these, add text to these, add text to these, and maybe add another horizontal box in this one, add a few texts to that one horizontally. Absolutely no problem. So the next one is the scroll box, which works almost as the vertical box does, except you can scroll through it. So if we add a text, you can also see the size isn't there because it doesn't make sense because it's an infinite um, amount of space technically. So if we add a lot until it goes out of bounds here, you can see it just stops there and we can just scroll up and down in this box. And again, the UI overlay works almost the same as the UI layer, so it's this doesn't really make sense, but it just puts them all in the same place. The last kind of layout container is the floating window. If we add it, we get this cool, well, window. Um, you can resize it, you can move it. Um, you can add stuff to it, which uh, works the same way as vertical boxes do. You can also close it, which just makes it invisible, but it also affects uh, all of the child widgets. It also contains a few settings like the width, the height, the position the pos uh, of, on both axes, whether it's closable or not, and of course the title. Now the next one is really cool if you want to build your own event system scenes or make custom editor windows. It's the, the button. Um, if we add it, it'll look like nothing actually happened, but that's because the button tries to take on the size of anything that's inside of it. So if we add a text to it, then you can see the button appears. Um, the button has a color setting and of course all of the um, events which are needed to make it work, which is if it's clicked, pressed, released, hovered and unhovered. So clicked is down and up on the mouse. Pressed is only down, release is only up. Hovered, well, if I hover over it and unhovered when I unhover it. And also here the button acts as an overlay. So if I add multiple text, it stays on the same place. If you want to have it a different way, you need to add a vertical box yourself and then you can make a tall button with multiple texts. Uh, the next one is a spacer, which is just sort of an empty object. So if I, for example, add a horizontal box, add an image, and want to constrain this image to only the middle third, I can add two more spaces in here. Also tell them to fill. They all have the same fill value, so they'll all be the same width. And you can see the image is in the middle third, and these are just sort of empty objects that um, lay it out. So the next five all have to do with getting an input from the user. So let's start with the UI checkbox. Um, it's a checkbox, you can turn it on and off. Um, and of course it has the corresponding events on value change and on value change no parameter. So these are different in the case that this will automatically put the state it's in, so true or false, in its parameter. Whereas this one you can put whatever you want into it. Um, it of course has the option to be checked and it also has an op optional option name. What this does is, you can see down here, it can add it with a semicolon in front of the true and false, which is very useful if you want to use the set option value, which always needs an option name and then the option value. Similarly, the float field can be used to input a value, a floating point value, so with uh, decimal places. It also has an on-value change and on-value change no parameter. Um, of course, it's not a bool, so we have a value and we can also say uh, define a range. So if we say it's from negative 50 to 50, it only goes between those values. And it's exactly the same with the int field, except it only uses whole numbers without decimal places. The text field is very similar again. It has the two events, it has the current text, it has an option name, but it also has a type. So by default, um, it's just a text box as you know it. 
Um, but we can set it to multi-line, which just gives it, well, multi-line support. But then we also have material, which gives you access to the material, the custom materials. So if you want a custom editor that you can just input in material and um, apply to all of your props that you have selected, this is a way to do it. And you can just sort of select the ones that exist or edit them from here. And we have URL, which gives you access to the file explorer. So if you want a specific file or want to do a bulk import of something, this is the way to do it. And the last of the input fields is the color field which, um, well, it just has a color option name, same events, but it gives you a color picker and you can use the color for whatever purpose you need. <laughs> okay, next we have a progress bar. Um, it's just, well, a progress bar. You can select what color the fill color should be and what the background color should be. And it has a percentage value. And last but not least, we have the size box. The size box has quite a few settings. Um, if they're zero, it means this setting is not being used currently. So width override of zero doesn't mean it's zero pixels wide. Um, we can test this by adding an image to it. Uh, you can already see this is not zero by zero, even if we set it to use its full parent size. Um, but if we set something like 100 by 100, the widget will try to be exactly 100 by 100 pixels. The min desired width, max desired width, min desired height and max desired height all have to do um, with this object being inside a container that can somehow scale like a floating window or such. Um, and it tells it to be able to scale but only stay within specific uh, sizes. So if we say a sort of a min desired width of 100 and a max desired width of 200, then it can scale between those values. but if it get, gets too small, it'll stay at 100, and if it gets too big, it stays at 200. This, of course, only makes sense if the width override and height override are not set, so if you want to use them, make sure those are at zero. The last two settings of the size box are min aspect ratio and max aspect ratio, which, are, which work the same way as the desired width and height, um, in that they try to stay in an, a specific aspect ratio, so same width and height would be an aspect ratio of one, um, and depending on how they get scaled in a scalable container, they'll try to stay within the min and max aspect ratios. Okay, now that we went through all of these props, here's just some extra useful information that might help you if you are stuck. For example, not every um, UI object can support children. For example, an image cannot support a child. It'll also tell you. It'll tell you which uh, valid parents uh, exist. Uh, so just keep that in mind because this cannot be rendered otherwise. Another useful thing to know, which I forgot to talk about when I talked about the UI layer, is it has a visible in edit mode and visible in play mode um, toggle. So if you turn it off in play mode, it, this would mean if I go back to play mode, it wouldn't uh, appear anymore. Let's just quickly try that. If I add the text, I can see the text and now it's gone. Now it's back. Uh, or the other way around, I can say I don't want to see it here, but if I go into edit mode, oh, play mode, sorry, at the top left you can see the text and now it's gone again. Also in this tutorial there were not many objects present here at any time, so it was pretty easy to get around the scene. But if you have a scene that looks more like this, it's of course hard to find a specific element you want to edit. That's where UI edit mode comes in handy. If you click on it, you can see you can just click on any of these objects and it'll select them in the um, outliner. This also prevents any clicks. So these are buttons, for example, but clicking them doesn't actually activate the button. It just selects the object. So if I want to change this text, I can just click on it, change whatever I want. Or if I want to add an event to this button, it's very easy. Or if I want to delete a whole section, or oh, yeah, this, very easy. One last little thing. In edit mode, of course, it's easy to press buttons because you have a mouse cursor, but in play mode, you don't. So how do we fix this? Well, the player manager has a new event called set mouse cursor visible. I've set it up um, with an event called mouse visibility and this lever sets it to true or false depending on if it's on or off. So let's see I, if I click the lever, I have my mouse cursor. I can still right click to rotate the camera, but I have the mouse cursor. I can click in uh, everything. I can still play and if I want to lock the mouse again, I just flick the lever again and it's back to normal. Anyway, that's about all. I hope that was helpful. If you have questions, of course, feel free to ask them in the comments or in our Discord server. And until next time, goodbye.